Um, we thought about this evening um, because it's really difficult with all the changes to understand the direction that schools are moving in and your little ones are starting their school careers and so these changes are perhaps newer to you than you know the other people who've been through lots of different changes over time. Um, so this is called a curriculum and assessment evening but actually a lot of it is about assessment. The changes that are in the national curriculum um, and how we're adapting to those in school. So the, the key changes in the curriculum 2014 and you might say to yourself but we're actually in 2016 now so why is it called curriculum 2014 because that's the year the national curriculum changed changed from the old national curriculum to the new national curriculum it changed for all the children so in September 2014 except for the children who were last year's year two and year six so they were still taught under the old curriculum and they were still assessed under the old um, testing regime that has changed so the children this year in year two and in year six will be assessed under the new regime so we thought we'd have a quick look at at some of the changes. This is a much more demanding curriculum in terms of what's expected of children. Now I'm sure that if you've been to meet the teacher or if you've had any chats with the teacher about the children's work they will have said that to you. So for example some things that were previously in year four have moved down in some cases I think down as far as year two mm -hmm. some yeah. of those things. So what we were expecting a year four child to be able to do we now have to expect of a year two. Huge huge demands on children. Huge demands on staff to be able to get that from children and therefore mm. huge demands on parents to support us in doing that work. So we've just picked out some of the, of the changes, so what's new? There's a stronger emphasis on vocabulary development, grammar, punctuation and spelling. Now those of us who've been teaching for a long time, 35 years, Mrs Dance a long time, Mrs um, Thomas a long time, Mr Gordon not so long, Mrs Taylor not so long, you will know that what we were always aiming to do was to give children a really good grounding in the, the sort of technical skills of literacy, but actually to develop a love of reading, a love of writing, an enthusiasm to be creative writers, to want to write, to write for a purpose, and all those things. Now, I, I, I'm not being political when I tell you that actually what the children are going to be tested on and the, the key performance indicators against which they're tested, and we'll have a look at those in a minute, all to do around grammar, punctuation and spelling. All right? So they can be as creative as they like, but if they don't join their handwriting and they don't spell and they don't use punctuation correctly, they are not going to be at age-related expectations. So, so it's a huge demanding curriculum in terms of them. So handwriting is expected to be fluent, legible and speedy with joins present. Now these are for the children in at the end of year two. All right? Now that will be fine for some children who will be able to do that. That will not be fine for all children. And if they don't, before it used to be a best fit. So if they more or less got everything within that, uh, you know, assessment criteria, then they, they would have, say, their level 2B. Now, if they haven't got it, they won't get it. So it, they could be as creative and as wonderfully um, good at using technical language. But if they do not have a joined up, fluent, legible and speedy handwriting style, they won't be at it. So you can see that the curriculum has changed and it is more demanding. Five-year-olds will be expected to learn to count up to 100 compared to 20. Now some five-year-olds will be able to do that, some four-year-olds will be able to do that. I was watching some really tiny little children counting in Ash class today. They were whizzy. They could find their number on a number. In fact, they said to me, uh, we don't just put it on the number line, we find it on the 100 square, which Mrs Dance told me afterwards wasn't what they were supposed to be doing. Well, I'm really year pleased one. they've done it. Yeah, really and impressed. they could find it. Yeah. But there are some other little children, because they all develop at different rates, who are still thinking, what is the number? And they're still counting objects, but not accurately, and so you've got that whole range of things. So here we go. These are all the changes. I'm not going to read them to you. You, you can see them on there for yourself. So... But to balance that, there is a greater freedom for us to do some of the more exciting things like design and technology. So this has a greater importance. Now, if, you, if your child likes art and design technology, then for them, this is a really key thing. In, it, oh, <laughs> in another life, I used to be a design technology coordinator. There is nothing more exciting than working with children on a design technology project, starting out from scratch with that kind of creative, what are we going to make, how are we going to do it, and then seeing it through to the end. So, so those are really positive things. The ICT curriculum is there, and Mr Gordon has done lots of work with staff on developing that across the school. And there's a much greater emphasis on factual information. When we first saw that, we thought, 
going to be so deadly. But actually, if you look in this classroom and you look at some of the things that are going on, some of these really say, old historical topics are coming to life in a really practical way. If you look over there on that red table, that's all about map work. Mm. Which is, do you want to say something about that? Yeah, <laughs> so people like Rally, um, Scott of the Antarctic, um, Ernie Shackleton, they're all sort of getting a new revamp of life. And rather than just you know, reeling off dates and figures, trying to sort of bring that into into a bit more meaning. So, you know, bringing the map work in there, the understanding of the continents and oceans on maps as well, then we can sort of plan around planning our own expedition. So you can sort of see how getting those yeah. historical figures is, is kind of like just a little bit of what else we can do to, to make it more So it is an interpretation, and I guess Mrs Thomas, you're not actually teaching the history curriculum. Uh, Mrs Williams is Mrs Williams that, yeah. teaching it, but I know, for example, she's... But I started <coughs> with the Greeks in the autumn term. So, so and, and it's about making sure that these topics that could be quite deadly, if it's just facts and figures and, and whatever, come to life and are relevant to the children and that they can see why it is they're learning them so that they can see something about the chronology of our history and so that they understand that they're part of something greater. Okay, now I'm going to go um, on to looking at a new statement. Now you've all got these on your, your little bit of, um, of a handout so you might like to look at them. Now they're called an interim, interim assessment framework or it's called an interim assessment framework because it's just for this year. And it's just for this year because they haven't decided what they're going to do. They may well develop this, it may get scrapped, who knows. So the children this year in year two and year six are going to be tested against these standards. And it's working towards the expected standard, working at the expected standard and working at greater depth within the expected standard. So levels have all gone, we don't have levels anymore. This is what we've got for this year. So this is reading, and the year two teachers will be looking at their children and assessing against that. They have to be able to do all of this before they can come into here. If they can't do one of these things, then they can't move to be at the expected standard, even if they can do some of those. So it's key that all those things are achieved by the children. Now, in reality, at the expected standard is not going to be every child because not all children are the same. If it was that easy, it would be brilliant, wouldn't it? It would be mm. really lovely. So what we're looking to do is to make sure that we move children as quickly as we can and that we, they all make good progress from their starting points because some of them will not be starting at, at the year two bottom level. I'll call it the bottom level, at the emerging level. They will be on, still on a year one curriculum, but it's making sure that they um, make good progress against that and that we narrow the gap you have heard that statement, that means that if you've got children who are a long way adrift of where their age-related expectation is, that we make sure that that gap is narrowed by doing things like interventions and booster groups and all that kind of work. If the child is towards the upper end, though, yeah. I mean, you narrow the gap or you leave the child where it is? No. Now, under the old system, and, and uh, there are parents here, you know, you've got shame, so you've got children who are old enough to have been under the old system where we had levels. So if you had a child, if, if I stick with key stage one, so if I had a child in year two who was really able, at the end of um, year two, they may, may well achieve a level three. And some of your children here have achieved level threes. Now they may have achieved a level three in reading or writing um, or numeracy. The level three was not within their age-related expectation. It was in a higher age range. So you would have some year three children who would achieve a level three and that would still be acceptable. Under this brave new world, we are not supposed to move outside the year. So um, if children are in year two, they should be covering all this year two work. And if they are more able, they will be working at a great depth within the expected standard. It's probably worth just saying that this is the kind of terminology that you'll probably be reading at the end of the year when it comes to reporting and so on. Um, rather than looking at a national level and then sort of working out, engaging where your child is in relation to the national average, this is the kind of sort of language that will be in, in the end of year reports. Um, those that are working right at the sort of top end um, and greater depth within the expected standard, there's a lot of work to cover before then and it is worth just restating that they have to have covered everything in every box before they get down there. So. Even though Teresa was just there talking about sort of moving them on to another group, that that is going to be for very very few children because there is so much to cover in there, mm. and and open statements like the bottom one on your first page of reading, making links between other books that they've read, 
because there's no specification of there of how many books they, they should read or what books they should be reading, that's a pretty open-ended statement to say, well, there's no going up to the next year group. They should just be making links all the time and, and therefore just keep them you know, in that box rather than looking to go into the next year group's box. Um, I've highlighted a couple just because um, they, they might be sort of stumbling points. In the first one, where it's towards the expected standard, um, this one here, reading aloud many words quickly and accurately without overt sounding and blending. I think that one is, is quite a hard challenge for a lot of children, especially those that we would have put in this box for working towards the standard. We sit and we listen to children daily and of course they're using their phonics to break down, to decode those words and then to segment them and then work out what they sound like and put them back together. We encourage that, that's the way that we teach reading. And of course there they're saying they shouldn't be doing that, they shouldn't be overtly sounding and blending, that should be a process going on in their head and then they just say the words. So even though we teach one thing and it's in the curriculum to teach that thing, there is some things in here in the, in the end of year and the key stage standards that you think mm, maybe okay, um, and this is this is reflected down here when when they have this statement they're not overtly sounding and blending and they're reading at over ninety words a minute. <laughs> we don't have a stop clock out and we don't sort of make sure they've got through a threshold of ninety words. That's a ballpark figure and and really, you know, we we've started to not just have children reading sentences. There are videos now of children reading, so when we go to moderation with other schools as, as staff, we can confidently say to other teachers and moderators, saying, we think our children are in this band because, and we don't have data like 90 words a minute, we do have data though that shows children reading and reading fluently. <coughs> um, this one here, um, I've highlighted just because I think this is quite a good one at home. I'm sure a lot of you probably go away tonight thinking, what can I do for my child? Um, answering questions and making inference on the basis of what is being said and done in a, in a familiar book that is read to them. Quite often we get our children to read to us. Um, maybe not all the time we read back. Um, and a real stipulation within the, the literacy curriculum now is getting children... Um, accessing text that is not at their age range, that's above them. So you delivering text to them that is above their age. So they're exposed to different vocabulary, they're exposed to new forms of punctuation and new ideas before they can read it. So in effect, they've seen it before they get there in year five and six, which is you know not a bad idea really, but it is in the top box rather than maybe we would have thought it would have been down there before. Um, in terms of writing, which is I think on the back of yours rather than on the second page, um, Big, big emphasis on spelling in every box. Um, and the way that they disseminate between the two spelling is that they spell some words correctly and some common exception words. These ones spell most and many. Um, so again, a bit like the 90 words a minute thing, it, it is sort of a bit vague in terms of where's the cut-off point to sort of say, well, you're spelling some and you're spelling most. But um, we can see here that spelling is just repeated quite all, quite a lot all the way through. So, as Theresa sort of mentioned earlier, that technical accuracy is, is something that's really, really um, being pushed for at the moment. Um, <clears throat> this one as well was the other big one, is making sure they use diagonal and horizontal strokes to join in some of their writing. You can have children that are really, really confident, creative and knowledgeable, and you think, oh, I really want to put you in there, but like we say, unless they're joining their writing, that's another stumbling block to hold them back. Unfair, harsh, I, you know, you could call it lots of things, but that's, that's a reality, and that's why we started joining now in reception even, that as soon as they come into school, they have a handwriting policy that is followed all the way through to year six, and it is joined. Um, the one sort of let off is it's, again, some of their writing, and the one down here is most of their writing, so hopefully we can, we can get through that one. Um, numeracy, we can see he's got a massive, massive push this this curriculum because he goes on to two pages and rather than sort of try and pick all of these um, I'm hoping that you can sort of see straight away with all the numbers that it is a big, big, big number curriculum. Um, the first box has one statement in it that's not number related. They can recognise some triangles, rectangles, squares, circles and cuboids. The rest is all number based. So it doesn't matter if they can name shapes if they can't do any calculations, that they're still in here, unfortunately. Um, and, and these are calculations that maybe we would have expected 
other children and higher ability children to be doing at the end of Key Stage 1 before. Um, you know, we're talking about the reading and writing numerals, not just sort of in number form, but also writing them as well. Um, they've got no number reversals, 14 and 41 and so on. So although the child may know, if they're not writing it, you know, that's, that's one of the, another one of those stumbling blocks. Luckily, still in, in year two, we as teachers have the final say in terms of where the child is at. So even though <coughs> they have two numeracy papers to sit, if for whatever reason the numeracy papers don't go so well, we still have the, the overriding call to say actually looking on a year's base work of work and looking back at year one, this is the progress they made and I feel that they are here rather than whatever their papers might say, um, which is more key stage two. Um, year ones then, what Ooh. test do they sit? They sit a phonics <coughs> test and Sharon's going to take us through that. <laughs> year one, and in brackets it says two. Now, all year ones have to take the phonics screen, they call it a screening check for the children. We don't actually call it a test, but we know it really is. Um, and it says, and um, year twos. Now, so only some year twos will have to sit the screening check again, because up until now, it's normally out of 40, and the cutoff point is 32. So if you get 32 of your words, um, correct, then you've got, got it and you don't have to take it again. If you are a year one and you get a 31, you've got to do it again and hopefully next year you will get it though because we know in the past that children have almost got it one year as a year one and of course some year ones are still quite young when they're taking it because it's normally June time, June isn't it? June yeah. time. Um, and um, we know the ones that have just sort of not quite got it, they always get it the next year. So, let me just sort of recap a little bit about phonics though, because phonics is a real biggie um, when it comes to liter 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 literacy, I can't speak there, um, because of course all our words are made up of phonetic sounds. And there are 42 sounds in the English language plus all the alternative spellings so there's an awful lot there and anybody who know, who's got children in ash class knows right from the beginning they're coming home with a little phonics sheet and um, with s in it and doing the action and everything like that and of course it gets harder as it goes along but by the end of reception we've normally covered all the sounds and we are carrying on with the alternative spellings as well at the end of um, by the end of year one we hope that all children, there's a, there are five phases, and actually six I think, but five that we tend to, to teach, um, phases of phonics, because they need that to be able to pass the phonics screening check. Now, you might be going, hang on here, these are really strange words, they don't look right. Well, you are correct, because they, are, they call them pseudo words. We, I call them um, like monster words. Because what it's basically saying, if you know your phonic sounds and you know that that means a uh sound, then you can go n, er, t, nert, okay? And you can sound it. Of course, there are some sounds that you might think, well, I could say ch, or I, I think that's just chop. But <laughs> they, do, do, they do allow for that if there's like an alternative um, sound with those spellings, and that's okay. But... Basically, if you know that's a k sound at the end, so it's d, a, k, d, a, k, and they can blend it and put it together to make a word, that is fine. And you know that they're actually quite a good reader, because we know we come across sometimes people's names that we can't, we can't actually st straight away mm -hmm. know what it is, and we use our phonics to make sense of it. And that's basically what they're doing. And the phonics screening test is in, it's in two sections. You have 20... <coughs> pseudo words and you have 20 <coughs> normal straightforward words that they use every or maybe almost every day and they just have to basically decode they can go er, I, s, rice they have to make a word of it they can't just blend <coughs> it and not do anything with it they, they've actually got to make a word um, and then if they can get most of those right as I say normally it's 32 out of 40 yeah. every year they keep it a secret and they don't tell us until after we've taken it, just in case we've you know, done something naughty in the test. Not that we would ever do that. So that's basically how it works. And the majority, and we do really, really well. 
I mean, we do phonics every day. Uh, I'm sure you do phonics every day too. And I know you're, it's you're we carry on picking up spelling. phonics as well. And so it's a, it is a biggie. It's about 20 minutes each day. And at home, there are lovely things to do if you go on um, on the computer. I think it's phonics. I can't think of the name of it now offhand. But there's lots of phonics games to play at home on the computer, which they really enjoy doing. So. I think phonics play is the one. You've got espresso as well. Yeah. Espresso, espresso as well. <laughs> and we do use espresso quite a lot and they love those ones and they're lovely activities to do. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back dry again. <laughs> uh, the, the year two ones are, are slightly, um, slightly harder, I suppose. The clock's on there because it's all done in the month of May. Um, the phonics is also done within a set period of dates. The year two ones are also, you know, they have to be done in May. Um, that being said, of course, the year the year six ones are also in May, so that gives us even less time to, to make sure that they're sorted out. Um, and I know we've got a residential as well, sort of planned for, for around then. So there's there's kind of you know a lot to try and fit in there, particularly as there are lots of papers. There's two reading, there's two numeracy, there's two um, spag spelling and grammar tests as well. Um, alongside then getting all of the children's work together and making a judgment to then pass off right at the beginning of June um, to the moderators and then going from there. So we've, we've got to really sort of get on with this in, in May. Um, as Teresa said, the creativity and the content of writing is now gone. There's no writing paper at all anymore. Sorry, I'm just going to stop you there. It hasn't gone as far as we're concerned in school oh, yeah, sorry, because yeah. I would be really disappointed and sad if that was the case. But the judgment about it, so please don't think that we're going to, you know, just have really dry writing. We are still encouraging children to be creative and to be um, adventurous, providing they can do all the technical stuff. <laughs> so it is that balance, isn't it? They're going to be encouraged to do lovely writing about the explorers and expeditions and things, but it's been underpinned by that sort of need to make sure the technical accuracy is there yeah yeah and and um those those papers are there we've got two reading papers and two numeracy papers again before you would have sat one and if we thought it was appropriate for you to sit another one a level three paper you would have sat two um but now both papers are sat unless there's a, a real concern during the test um that your child can't do the paper and therefore they're taken out and then we have to re write a report why that was the case so we're hoping that both papers will be taken and, and no problems there. Um, in terms of the spelling and grammar test, the spellings are exactly the same. There are 20 spellings um, and they're read by a teacher um, in a sentence format and they just have to fill in the word that's missing um, on their piece of paper. Um, usually takes about 15 minutes and there's 20 marks there, so 50% of the marks from the spelling and grammar. Um, the other uh, marks are made up from the actual sort of PAG side of it. The, uh, punctuation and grammar and you can see with the breakdown of percentage of marks the grammar is the big sort of push there for for the curriculum um, and punctuation depending on what's the, what's the priority of, of the time they they might well push that one up as well vocabulary not not really a big a big sort of thing there you thought it would have been thirded but apparently not um, there just a couple of questions that I've decided to pull out um, this one here we need to understand a lot of terminology now in, in year two and, and be able to recognise certain forms of sentences. So not just being able to work out what sentences make sense and then putting a tick by the one that makes sense. It's now working out actually, is that sentence a statement? Is it a question? Is it a command or is it an exclamation? And knowing the difference between all four. Um, the next one, again, not just <coughs> forms of sentences, but forms of, of words as well. The, the terminology of adjective, adverb, noun and verb and so on. Um, that's, that's there. But we've also got a big shift in the last one. Whereas you may have put the capital letter or you may have expected you know, the question to be based around put the capital in the right place or put the full stop in the right place. Mm -hmm. They've done that for you. They want the reason why the capitals are there. So it's a kind of, it's a shift really, going from rather than just the understanding to a full on reasoning of, of why it is. Not just because it starts a sentence or whatever, as King does there, but the, the, all of them, why are they there? Um, the reading, um, they're mostly one mark questions. Between one and three uh, questions are, are two marks. So very equal weighting throughout the paper. Uh, the majority of questions are multiple choice, short response questions rather than extended pieces. Um, paper one, 
um, and paper two both carry 20 marks. Um, paper one is supposed to be the easier style paper, and I will just grab that. And the, these are available afterwards if you want to have a look through. These are what they call the immediate response papers, and I'll just pull out any page. They have a piece of text and then the questions below, um, and that's all the way through. Um, between four and seven hundred words per per paper, so you know a fair amount of wording in there. Particularly, some children might not even have that many in the books that they read on a daily basis. Um, they're suggesting about thirty minutes for that paper. Whether or not we decide to sit that, that's our discretion. Do we break it up into smaller chunks of say fifty minutes, go and get a bit of fresh air, and come back with fresh eyes? Do we sort of give them extended time? That's not a statutory saying. Right, thirty minutes is up. Whatever you've done is what's done. Um, and that's really important when we're thinking about the next one. Forty minutes is a long time to sit and look at paper two, which, which is quite heavy. I'll be honest. For a, no pictures, <laughs> you will sit and you will read. And unfortunately, the question book is separate to the answer booklet. So whereas the immediate response one, at least the, the text had the information and you put the information straight away underneath, that's quite a key skill now, is being able to think, where was that information across all of those pages? And I'm going to go back and find it now. Um, and then they have a non-fiction as well. Now, it's not always going to be fiction and non-fiction. It could be two non-fictions, it could be two fictions. So they might even have sort of two versions of that. We don't know. Um, these are the sample booklets, and you're welcome to, to have a look at them and take them if you want Mr. to. Gordon, afterwards. Can I just ask, is the, um, the, the answer booklet that goes with this one, does it actually say the number of page? Because it used to, didn't it? It used to say... Have a look on page one look and, on page and see. Or page yeah. whatever. Can could, I just make yeah. a point could, here? Could well be. Well, it is a is sample it? booklet yeah. at the moment, yeah. and, and the, the um, key performance indicators and the <coughs> assessments have changed. They changed last on the 22nd of December, so they will change yeah. again. So I don't know if they are or not at right. this moment. Okay. But, just, but can I just that is a, a very difficult thing to as do. As being an old, uh, an old, yes, I'm old. Um, I used to be a year two teacher. That used this used to be le the level three paper. Yeah. Mm. This is exactly the same sort of thing as you used to be level three. I know we're not allowed to call levels now. No, but, but you can was. see that the demands are greater, mm. much greater for an average child. And the really sad bit about it is, is that all children have to sit mm. those papers. So, yeah. you know, if you are the weakest child in the class, mm. you're going to be in there. That's why I'm glad it says that the teacher can take a child out. Because if you are a weak child, then actually that is a really difficult thing to be sat looking at that booklet, knowing you can't read it, and everybody around you is doing something. Yeah. So really... With the older children, we, we split our children up so they don't all sit in there because if you're um, 10 or 11, you're really aware where you are. And I don't want any child at 10 or 11 feeling that they failed because it isn't a failure, it's a system we have to work with. So that possibly is also something we, you know, oh, we yeah, can do. Oh yeah, here. again, a bit like the timings, they can have you know adults with them to be able to read the questions in the... Um, the, the spelling and grammar and the numeracy, obviously not in the reading, um, unfortunately, but they can be in small groups as well. So that would be something that we would definitely do. It wouldn't be everybody sat in the school hall. No. <laughs> um, just a quick look at the weighting. Um, we can see this is the big one. There are sort of others that are fairly uh, heavy, but you know the identifying the key bits and bobs of fiction and non-fiction. Um, so even though within the literacy we might be looking at very much the technical side of it, those those aspects that we would have taught before, such as non-fiction having to have titles, subtitles, paragraphs, you know, diagrams with, with captions and so on, they're still going to be looking for those kinds of things and, and why writers might use them. So we need to make sure that we are still teaching that as, as much as anything. Um, and the other big one is, is making those inferences from the text. So again, rather than just being able to read being able to then understand why a, a writer might do this, where they might have gone in the future if they continued the text, where you know where they might pull other information from, and that's something that can be really, really well practiced at home when they're just reading other sort of bits and bobs at home. You know, where where else might we go looking for the same sort of information? What could we look up? What would Google sort of say? And, and trying to pull everything together. Um, in terms of the numeracy, even though there's two papers. Um, they are both big, big number papers. A bit like the um, the curriculum itself, it's very heavily number weighted, um, between 80 and 90 percent number weighted. So, what we're teaching them is going to be what they're tested on, basically. Um, 
and very much a, a case of reasoning as well as just being able to crunch numbers. Um, understanding tens and ones, um, understanding of place value and understanding the inverse of calculations as well. Being able to sort of reason that just because it says it's an addition, I need to be able to work out the, the inverse, the subtraction of that to, to test that hypothesis as well. And we can see that one on this one. Um, you know, Amy writes an answer to the calculation below. So 57 subtract 31 equals 26. They need to understand that that can be flipped on its head and they can have an addition from that um, rather than just being able to do lots of subtraction or lots of addition. The understanding between all of the operations. Um, <clears throat> luckily, the paper so far, again it is a sample booklet, but so far has been set out very similar to their numeracy books. They're used to seeing these grids and again they'll be used <coughs> to seeing test-like materials. We're not teaching to the mm. test, we're not going to sit them down for weeks on end and just teach them the test. However, there will be test-like materials that they can sort of be exposed to the idea of testing and what is appropriate and not appropriate in test room and conditions and so on. Um, but things like money, uh, things like time, those sort of things that need lots of practice again it could be something that's done at home when we're thinking about what what can we do to support our children outside of the classroom just those repeated skills and I know lots of people don't play with coins anymore or anything like that we've all got debit cards and wireless payments on Apple phones and so on but they, they are still very much in there because they're numbers in the real world so they're quite they're quite liked on the test papers um, <clears throat> times tables again that key repetition skill of just hammering out until they've got it. Um, it still says on all of the end of year expectations, twos, fives and tens. However, when you look at the questions, they're counting in threes. Mm. And that's, that knows your three times table. If you know that you know three, seven and 21 all have something to do with each other, you'll understand that question far easier than somebody trying to, to work out the fractional amount. Speaking of fractions, it's no longer just fractions of shape, there's also fractions and numbers as, that, as, as, as shown there as well. And, and rather than just quarters and halves, three quarters to... Um, these are all outlined in the, in the age-related expectations on, on your sheets. Um, but this is just, you know, just showing you what's in those sample booklets. It sounds really negative, it sounds really dry, I know, but we've got to stay positive. Um, we, we certainly feel very positive in school still. It's not like we're sort of thinking, right, this is, this is the end of days. Um, we, we love our job that we do. And, you know, I was sat with Nikki this afternoon planning what we're doing post-February in terms of our literary curriculum. And we're really excited about that. So in terms of what we're doing as a school, our job is to deliver a balanced and inspiring curriculum, keeping up to date with those changes. You're talking about the, the way that the, this is constantly changing. It's an interim framework. It's for this year. We don't really know what's coming next. Um, and ensuring that pupils and parents are aware of their progress, you know, the new terminology, the understanding of where we're going with this, what's expected and so on, that you guys are aware as much as the children are aware of their own sort of learning. Um, but better together definitely what parents can be doing at home reading for fun reading reading to sort of as an enjoyable activity rather than just something that's done every night to you know get ticks in the reading record and so on and that reading for meaning as well not just going through as many books as we can but those inferences from the text the meaning of the text and what the writer was was trying to to get across and those repeating skills of times tables number bonds um time and and money very much we teach the skills in school. We dedicate a lot of time to them. We block out lots of time around it. But if they leave at 3.15 and they never see it again until nine o'clock the next morning, that, that's a long time to sort of try and remember something in your head, especially something as abstract as, as time and, and multiplication. Um, but together, hopefully that positive attitude to learning as well, that, you know, yes, these are big changes. Yes, they're ramped up, but still we enjoy coming to school. We enjoy coming to school and and I know that the, the children in this class enjoy coming to school and, and you sort of walk around the playground. <laughs> Everybody does. <laughs> yeah. Right, thank you, Dave. Now, Dave is clearly the year two teacher who has the bulk of children. Mrs. Thomas has got year two children in her class as well and she will be doing the same sorts of things. So they're working really closely together. You might, as a parent, think, well, I don't have a year two child. I've got a reception child or I've got a year one child. But the aim is to see how you have to start right from the beginning to build up all those skills. You can't do it all in year two. It's just too much to do. So it is making sure that everybody understands that right from reception all the way through the school, 
the whole expectation has changed for children and therefore we have changed <coughs> to respond to that. It would be unfair, wouldn't it, to get to year two, our, we want our children to be at least at age expected relations or above. We don't mm. want our children to be lagging behind um, unless there's a reason, you know, if they're mm. not at that level because actually they, they, they haven't made so much progress because of their ability. So you might be saying to yourself, well, what can I do? Dave's talked a little bit about um, what you can do to help, but we were thinking that one of the really th things that everybody more or less loves is reading with their children. And one of the things on here is about um, reading books that are, are at a more advanced level than your child is able to read for themselves. So some of you may already do that. You know, you read, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking of slightly older children, but something like Swallows and Amazons, that parents often read those things, or they read Harry Potter to children because they love it, but they're not able to read it for themselves. Um, and we were thinking, well, what would be a really easy way to help parents um, access materials? Now, I'm asking you, you what you think of this idea. We tried it with older children, um, and, and the older children's parents enjoyed doing it, to have a little pack, and in the pack are, are two books the older children had. Um, uh, but you have a book that you read to your child and that you talk to them about, but they can follow the book in their copy. So they may not be able to read all of it, but they're accessing it at the same time. And then you're talking to them about some of the more technical aspects of, of um, the punctuation and what have you. But the really important thing is things like the vocabulary. You know and I know that very young children love playing with words. They don't always understand the words. And, and you know, sometimes when they come and they, they say things like, normally if they're <coughs> telling me something about being in trouble, they say, they said a really rude word. And you say to them, what did they say? They say, I can't say, it's really, really rude. And you say, you can, you can whisper it to me. You're allowed to say it to me. And then they'll say something like, shut up. You know, because their understanding of language is at a different level. So I think it's about exploring language in all its form, not swear words, obviously, um, and about talking to them about what do those words actually mean and how could we use them in a different way. Um, and they're really nice things to do with children. They don't take a lot of time because parents we know are really busy people. You've got lots of children, got more than one child, and that you'll be expected to do that with. But I think it would just be, what do you think, if you had a little pack that you could collect either non-fiction or fiction, and that when you found time to do it, so we're not saying this needs to be done every night, take that pack home and fill it in the reading record, but that it was just something that you could, maybe on a Friday you, you collect a pack and you think, we're going to spend some time over